acceptance with or without corrections of the July 23rd meeting minutes. I make a motion to approve. Okay, there's a motion to approve by Selectman Devans. Is there a second? Second. Selectman by Select Selectman Adams. Any corrections? Not hearing any. All those in favor of accepting the minutes say aye. 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 That's 4-0. Uh, next is uh, we have our announcements and we have a couple. I, uh, in the spirit of the Olympics, I just wanted to uh, make note that the police department uh, got a bronze medal in the Crispin's House softball tournament. They came in third place. That's not in your packet, Phil. Just it was some information. No, I was just checking the other I, one that you have because I have a concern that I shared, and I think that. There was no performance enhancing drugs or anything like that involved, so it was a legitimate bronze uh, medal. And um, I did play against them. They were a pretty good team, so congratulations, Chief. <laughs> yeah, and I'd also like to add that uh, oftentimes you put a weakest player out in right field, and Chief Sullivan was prowling right field with cat-like prowess. <laughs> I'm sure they thought he wouldn't have many opportunities, but he had many, many opportunities and was flawless on every one of them. <laughs> And uh, Selectman Adams was uh, one of the umpires for the, uh, for the day. So it was a good time had by all. I um, want to read to uh, you a letter. This is to the Chief of Police. Don't include that. Okay. Uh, basically, it was uh, complimenting both the whole department, but in specific, uh, Detective Tom Hammond. Uh, and that was with regard to a, a case in which he was very persistent, and it led to a successful uh, uh, I guess, uh, prosecution uh, of, of a matter. So the, the person was very complimentary of the department and, and uh, Detective Hammond. Uh, next uh, announcement is the with regard to uh, Reed Street, and I'll read that. Uh, this is effective uh, August 10th. The Goffstown Sewer Commission announces sewer construction on Reed Street. Work will begin on Monday, August 13th, which is today, and continue uh, Monday through Friday uh, for about two weeks. And so for those of you who don't know where Reed Street is, it's uh, very close to Maple Avenue Elementary School, and it's where the, uh, we have the uh, senior apartments, uh, senior citizen apartments. So uh, that's about a two-week two -week job there. Are there any other announcements? I, I do have one other. There was a, a scheduled uh, concert uh, sponsored by both uh, the Parks and Recreation Department and the Goffstown Lions Club. And as luck would have it, uh, the forecast is for rain and thunderstorms on Saturday. Uh, and in speaking with both the director of Parks and Rec and the event uh, promoter, we've decided to postpone that. And uh, we're contemplating having it during the Pumpkin Regatta weekend, but we're going to contact Main Street to see if that's okay. And if it is, then we'll, uh, we'll proceed in that vein. So there will be no um, concert this coming Saturday. I just yep. had one thing, and I did uh, I wanted to uh, personally compliment Public Works uh, for the work that they performed on the installation of the uh, water line for Grassmere Town Hall. Uh, Jeff Surrett, uh I believe it was Jeff that was in charge in Mike Hill House, um, but them and the entire crew and, and the work that they've done, they were able to uh, come in underneath the driveway and they didn't even have to the, the ramp didn't even have to get disturbed, but they brought the line in, into it, into the um, building, and um, all the design work that, that the guys did and, and all the work was uh, really to be uh, com uh, commended. Okay. All of them. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll oh, move. I'm sorry, Colin. Do DPW up update? Sure. All right. Um, several things going on. First, the Mass Road Paving Project. Rocks finished all of the mill, milling and shimming last week. Uh, the side streets and driveways have been trimmed. That means they've been saw cut so that it can accept the uh, final coat of pavement so it'll all be flush. Uh, the raising of structures began last Friday and will continue this week. Uh, that's the process of raising the catch basin, manhole, uh, frames and grates as well as the water gates or shutoffs so that they'll eventually be flush with the finished pavement. East Coast Signals began installing the traffic loops uh, in the pavement. You may have seen some of those as you drove along Mass Road this week. In other projects, East Dunbarton Road drainage, road, drainage work was completed this week, uh, and the reclamation of the old pavement is scheduled for uh, this coming Wednesday. Um, Selectman Devanza just mentioned the work that was done at the Grassmere Town Hall. And then finally, the Pine Ridge drainage. That project has been completed. All the areas have been finished, loamed, and seeded. And they have the signs removed by uh, by the end of last week. I believe they're all gone. I didn't see any, at least on my way down today. 
uh, and post-contraction surveys will be sent out on Monday. So that's an update on DPW activities. All right. Thank you. Uh, next is an opportunity for those uh, who are in the audience to uh, present any public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to be heard? Okay, there, there isn't anyone. Uh, next up, we have uh, Police Chief Sullivan, and uh, Chief Sullivan is here to uh, discuss our reaccreditation with Kalia. Thank you. I'd ask the, uh, my accreditation manager, Michelle Preventure, and my uh, assistant to come up, Denise Roberg, please. <laughs> Looked very familiar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this past, um, we've just received our seventh award for reaccreditation. Um, we've been at this since 1992, uh, which we received our first award, and continued through the process since then. Um, the process is a uh, comprehensive review of all our, all facets of our agency, um, and to and compare it to nationally recognized and accepted standards and practices of our law enforcement profession. This past April, we welcomed two independent CLEA assessors to come to our agency, evaluate our operations, personnel, policies, procedures, and seek input from the public as to how we are fulfilling our mission. During the last week of July, we attended the final hearing before the Commission of Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, CLEA, for the final review. I am pleased to announce that the Gostown Police Department was awarded a seventh award for advanced accreditation with meritorious distinction. People ask why accreditation? And I think the answer is why wouldn't we? Um, the standards in addition to addressing the high liability areas such as firearms and vehicle driving um, pursuits, etc., also address solid and defendable personnel practices, accounting, oversight, auditing, development and goals, and not, not only seeking but acting on the feedback from our community. While this is an honor, a true reflection of our entire agency, we not, that we not only uphold the 374 standards, but we embrace them each and every day. With that, there are two people that deserve to be recognized. Again, Michelle Preventure and Denise Roberge, who took all this good work and assembled it in a professional, understandable, and accessible files so that the assessors could come in and actually remark that it's some of the best files they'd ever seen. Um, I'd like to close with a final comment by Chief Cunningham, who is the chief of Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina Police Department, leaves 700, 700 sworn officers. Um, and his quote in the last portion of the final review, the agency has tremendous support from other agencies, but most importantly, its citizens. The Gostown Police Department delivers world-class service to its citizens. And that was in the final portion of our presentation. And, um, I think it speaks highly of the whole department as a whole and the service that we provide to the community. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just like to take uh, one minute to uh, personally thank uh, the department and everybody that that works on it since. Uh, I've been on the board and I attended the first time that we received, when we first received the first uh, accreditation back in 92, as the chief uh, mentioned. And uh, going back then, uh, we had the, uh, our, same, our same two that, that worked on the files. Uh, back then it was, uh, it was Mike French, chief who retired as chief, uh, who was the accreditation officer that was responsible and originally made the original presentation to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, back then I was on the budget committee at the, at the time. But the question I just wanted to add when you say, you know, why not, why accreditation? Uh, one of the things that uh, I as, as a Selectman uh, can appreciate is, you know, when we watch on the news things that happen all over the country, uh, things that happen in all, of a, all parts of the country, and a particular police department goes in, and afterwards, when you're looking at the at, at what happens and how it goes through the uh, the process uh, of through the court process, and when it's finally resolved, and you look at issues of how uh, evidence was overlooked or how people came into a crime scene, and they and they and they 
they just came in and they didn't understand how to go in and, and somebody, because of how they handled themselves, the, the case became a disaster and, and the result is everything, not, not what you would expect when you would see that, 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 that crime. And the thing is, is that the training that our, office, our department has is how to approach the crime scene, how to go through it, what to do, what not to do, and how to make sure that the evidence is not uh, compromised uh, throughout the case. And I have to say that uh, that's one of the top things that we have uh, to look forward to our, our department. And I just want to thank everybody for all the work that you've done all these years. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I, if I would, I just wanted to add a couple of comments as well um, on behalf of the board. Um, I think it goes without saying that we're very proud of, of the Goffstown Police Department as, as a board. Our community is very proud of the Goffstown Police Department, and I think that's evidenced in, in another accreditation from, from Kalia. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about community policing. I come from the New York City area, and um, but it means be, when you're proactive, when you're involved in the community, you're able to uh, address situations before they happen. And I think uh, it's very um, evident in Goffstown that there is a strong sense of community with our police department, and it kind of goes both ways. And that's something that's special. I don't think it's everywhere, but I know it's here, here in Goffstown. So um, on behalf of the board, thank you for all that you do. Um, and then just you know, echoing what uh, Chief Sullivan stated, um, special thank you to Michelle and Denise. Um, you probably don't know this, but you know, privately, many times publicly, the chief does speak so highly of the two of you and how much work that you put into this in terms of countless hours and, and nights and weekends doing all this extremely, um, how should I say, arduous task of compiling all these things. And we're very fortunate to have employees like you in the town of Goffstown who it means more than just, you know, collecting a paycheck. This is something that's pride in what you do and, and pride in where you work, and you exemplify that, and we're very, very pleased to have you uh, work for the town of Goffstown, and the community appreciates all that you do. So thank you. Um, with that being said, um, we have the chief here. We also have our DPW director, Carl Quorum, and we're going to be talking about nighttime paving. So I'd like to uh, bring the two of you up. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, back when we awarded the paving contract to Brox Industries, I know a couple of you raised the question of nighttime paving. Um, at the time, we really felt like we should try to do it during the daylight. Um, Everybody we had talked to, you know, you just end up with a better product when you when it's light out and you can see. Uh, after getting involved in the milling and shimming operation, um, Brox Industries actually approached us and recommended that we consider doing it at night. Um, their reasoning, and just to tell the board, if we had bid it requiring night work, there would have been a premium put on night paving. So it just it's not something they just lightheartedly do. Um, however. With the amount of traffic, particularly the turning movements, uh, all of the truck traffic and everything going in and out of that center lane into all the businesses, uh, we really saw it on the shim coat that um, there's just no way to keep people off it long enough for it to really cure. And they're concerned with, you know, getting it rutted up right from the get-go uh, as soon as they put the, the finished coat of asphalt on it. I don't know if you've driven through it, but it, uh, it's already 100% better just with the shim on it. Yeah. Um, when we get that final asphalt, you know, get all the structures raised and get that final asphalt on it, I think we're going to have a great product. But that's their concern is uh, with the amount of traffic down there and the uh, particularly the turning traffic, they just think that we'll end up with a much better finished product if we consider doing it at night. They're uh, guesstimating, I'm going to say five nights, um, it all depends how it goes, you know, weather-wise, temperature-wise, um, but, but they're guesstimating it's probably five nights worth of, of paving to do the entire stretch. And um, we have sat down, police and Brocks and DPW, and we've talked about traffic detail and uh, doing it in the dark. We certainly want to have blue lights flashing, so we've kind of worked out a plan for that. <laughs> and. Uh, getting our hands on some light towers, but if the if the board's amenable to it, that's what we would like to try to do. And it would be, uh, 
if the weather holds this week and we get all the structures raised, we're targeting um, starting Sunday night, August 19th. So next week we would get it done and we've got the, the traffic loops at this point are all installed and functioning. Um, and we've hopefully got the paint contractor lined right up. They recommend waiting a couple of weeks to let the asphalt cure before you paint it. Um, however, with school starting September 4th, we're, we're doing what we can to, to get as much of it painted around the school as we can before school starts. So that's, that's the plan. I had a couple of questions. Um, you said that had nighttime paving been in the contract, it would have come at a premium. So is Brock's proposal to do it without any add-on cost? Right. That's correct. Okay. Uh, my other question was, um, had you done anything to survey the businesses and the residents to see how they would feel about nighttime paving, just to get a sense of the pulse of the community? And well, I, not the residents, um, but when we talked to the businesses before this whole thing started, almost 100% of them or said, nighttime. could you pave it at night? Could well, you I'm pave sure they would. Right? <laughs> yeah. The businesses are closed, but right. <laughs> how do the residents right. feel? <laughs> the, and we, we haven't heard from any residents, good or bad or indifferent. Um, you know, it, it's Have we done anything to reach out to them to make them aware of the... Not other than the that. website and advertising this discussion on this meeting. And on this, the results of this meeting would be put out to Nexel, et cetera, so. Yeah. Okay, I think it's important to take those steps to let folks know so there's no surprises. Yeah, the, you know, we've got message boards down there yeah, at either yeah. end and we'll, we yeah. put something on there as well. Just Great. People that heads up. Um, either way, if we don't do the night paving, the paving would still be that week um, at this point. That's when we're in the schedule, but it, so what hours would we be talking about? They're talking about starting at 8 o'clock at night and trying to get out of the road right around 6 in the morning before things get rolling. Uh, that long of a yeah. 10 hour. With the 80 plus manhole covers that have to be raised, Carl, how does that? Almost 200. Well, I, oh. I see. The, I see. I, I see the numbers of the actual manholes. You've yeah. got them started one through whatever. Yeah. I, the highest one I saw was like eighty or ninety. How does that play into the plan? I mean, are we on schedule with getting everything raised? Will that? You know, it's they just started them Friday, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Now that they kind of have a system down, we'll see how they do the next yeah. couple of days. But um, they feel they can get them done. We expressed our nervousness when we met with them Friday, so. They can always bring another crew in if they had to do. My other question I have is, before this new layer of asphalt gets down, they're going to sweep and, yep. and clean everything up? Because I won't say they did the best when they put the shim coat down. I, I, I saw firsthand as to what was left under there a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, I hope they pay a little bit more attention to the finer details when it yeah, comes we, time to... We also saw that. And okay, no, <laughs> we, that, no, we had that discussion. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, I saw I saw some there. of the some of the manhole covers. I mean, they they put the asphalt down, then they come by, rake it away, and then they chisel away the the extra asphalt that was there that should have been taken away. I mean, it's just. I will go on record as saying I think they need to be a little bit more careful about their their final. You know. That's in the minutes, right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I mean, I. I live in Pernardville. I see it every day. I, I watch him every day. I don't say hi. I don't introduce myself, but I'm just the guy going up and down the street, you know. You don't have a hard hat? No, I don't oh. have a hard hat. <laughs> not yet. I haven't been, That's I, the first year thing. <laughs> I haven't got a hard hat, and I haven't got a yellow jacket that's a DPW on the back. Uh, no, back back on the serious side, I mean, the the, the finer details of the, of the project need to be paid a little bit more attention. I asked Sue today. I mean, they're digging up in front of... Um, family, family, family dollar. dollar. I mean, well, that, that's the second or third time they've dug up in front of yeah, that, right? That, I mean, that's uh, that's not them though. That's right. family dollar. No, but right. still, I mean, you would think that somebody would have got it right. You would think the exactly. second time they should have got it right, but exactly. they still didn't. Yeah, exactly. that's an and issue now, with the site contract. Now we've got to. I mean, we've got to make adjustments to that and. Just, just for the record, the town's not making any adjustments. No, it's no, all no. on the site contractor. No, no. That's an I issue. I understand. I understand, but I mean, the site guy not taking you're, direction. You're told everything is done, ready to go, and I drive by. They're digging up the freshly, the freshly laid, yeah. put down. I don't know if we put it down or they put it they down. They put it down. <laughs> and I mean, they're, you know, but I mean. Yeah, they, they, they made assumptions after we told them exactly what was going to happen. They made assumptions of what they thought would happen, and if we would have just 
splendid to them. We'd have a hump there and the drainage wouldn't work. So we made them rip it out and, and redo it, much to their chagrin, but they, it's, they are doing it. It's, <clears throat> it's well underway. Um, I saw it being done, but I just, I wanted to comment on the, the final product as far as if they're short cutting shortcuts now, mm. what are they gonna, what are we gonna be faced with when the actual yeah. final product comes. That's, that's, I just, all I wanted to address was that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and just like I said, to be clear, that's not yeah. Brock's or the town's yeah. contractor. It has nothing to do with yeah. that. So. Yeah. But your observations on the sweeping and the cleanup, we've made the same observation and we did address that with them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the uh, time that you, the dates that you mentioned are for sure. For sure. That's no. it. That's what we've got scheduled now. You look at the weather forecast for this week. Wednesday well, looks like rain. That would screw everything. I okay. Thing, reason why I asked. I don't have a problem with the nighttime paving as long as it's done in August because middle to the end of August, many people are away. Yeah. It's a slow time for many businesses. The only business that I would have a concern about would be Mass Road um, because of the time of year and people in a rush for uh, projects and, and construction. And the only other thing is going on to six o'clock, I would make sure uh, that I would touch base with Mass Road Lumber because they have the largest volume of large trucks coming in and some of them may get there. I'm, I'm not sure what the timing is, but a lot of times some of them will come and you'll see them parked out there waiting for that chain to be taken off so they can they can deliver. Uh, and the only other thing was going to be uh, some of the delivery trucks for the gas stations or so that may come around that time. Just what what I'll do is um, you know if the board's amenable to this tomorrow, I'll send out an e-blast to all the businesses and just. Ask them to touch base if they have any issues like that, and, and we'll get the word out. Um, you know, we, we all want to get it done. We all want to get it done before school starts. So if weather hits, I'm sure they'll do what they can to not slip the schedule too bad, but it's time of year when everybody's trying to get stuff done. So it's we just got our fingers crossed that the weather holds. Any other questions? Yeah, just one thing, because I think the biggest issue, one of the big concerns that we had was tying up mass road in the daytime and I think that this will help alleviate that that issue uh, because you'll be able to drive over it by that time of the morning you're not going to keep a lane closed are you um, there was some we were we were looking at restricting I think the the, the traffic plan did, did Megan you didn't circulate that did you there is a draft of the press release and the traffic plan that Megan sent us late today or midday I, I, I can forward that today. to you though just so you can see it because okay. um, we did lay out what our what the traffic flow and traffic plan would be and we talked about starting at the Manchester end so that we're working away from the school just make sure that it's that that there's good communication with the businesses because everything that I heard was as long the sooner this is done the better and that's why everybody agreed to let's get it done so it's done and if the end of this month comes. We're done. We're out of there. They'll be. Everybody will be happy. Yeah, believe me. We all want. I that. know that. <laughs> <laughs> I had. I had one question, Carl, with regard to um, town oversight. I mean, traditionally, you know, if it was during the day, we're out there mm -hmm. and we're kind of observing and making sure that they're fulfilling their obligations. Is it safe to assume that that we're going to have staff that's going to be working yep. these six? whatever, at 8 p.m. to 6 a.m.? Yes. Okay. All right, any other questions? Um, with that, uh, you, you will need approval from the board, so I will accept a motion to proceed with uh, nighttime pavement, if that is. I'll make the motion that uh, the uh, nighttime paving for the Pernardville section of the Route 114 Master Road section be uh, allowed to be started at night from 8 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Second that. And, um, yeah, we're also, we'll do that separately. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have a motion and a second. Uh, any any other comments? Assuming not. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 
Um, we'll also need to I'll make um, a motion to uh, waive the noise ordinance for the paving in Penarnville for that same period of time. Yeah, okay. in conjunction with that, was that weighing. That's why I say in conjunction with the paving in case there is a delay, something happens because of the rain or the weather, and it's another day, so it's for the purposes of the paving project. All I'll right. second that. That's seconded. Any ago. questions or comments relative to that motion? Not hearing any. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 That's 4-0. Motion passes. And uh, thank you both. Carl, I know this has been a, a long one. So well, hopefully I, we'll I want to thank the folks from the police department for helping to make yeah. it as painless as possible because it's it is helpful. All right, and hopefully we'll be it'll be beautiful when it's all yes. said yes, and done. Will. So it already is a lot better as it is. <coughs> thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's about six twenty-five for those of you who are watching on television and. Um, Without any objections, we do have our auditors from uh, Melanson Heath and Company here. And without any objection, I'm going to ask them to uh, come on up and join us uh, tonight. Um, we have Frank Byron. And Frank, you've been here before. And Pat Mohan. Pat, I don't know if you've been before us. Have you? Uh, last year I was here. You were here as well? Okay. Yep. It's just not this see you. Okay. <laughs> I was in the front row. Right. Well, <laughs> welcome, gentlemen. And... Um, Thank you for coming tonight, and you're going to be discussing um, the annual financial statements and your overall audit of the town of Goffstown. So right. without further ado, take her away. Okay. My name is Frank Byron. I'm the president of Melanson Heath CPAs, and we performed audit services for the calendar year ended uh, December 31st, 2011. And I'd like to walk through the highlights of those financial statements with you this evening. If you have any questions as I'm going along, please feel free to ask. Um, if the questions get too difficult, that's why Patrick is here. <laughs> Patrick was the manager uh, out here during the audit, so um, he, he spent a lot of time out here on a day-to-day -day basis, so he's pretty familiar with the books. If you could turn your attention to the first page after the table of contents, this is the independent auditor's report. And this is what we were hired to do, is provide an opinion as to whether the rest of the financial statements in this document are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And this report is uh, what we would call a, a clean opinion. There are no exceptions, which is the same as the town has received in the past. So in our opinion as the outside auditors, these financial statements are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. This year, the town did not expend over a half a million dollars of federal funds as it did in the year prior. And because of that, there was no single audit required. Um, the single audit compliance audit kicks in if you spend over $500,000 of federal funds. Um, so that was not necessary this year. After these first couple pages, beginning on page three, Next section is called the Management Discussion and Analysis, and it actually runs from pages 3 through 10, and it's a narrative summary of the results of operation for the year. What it attempts to do is to put into words what the numbers say on, on the various financial pages. What I'd like to do is flip ahead to those number pages and talk about a lot of the same numbers that are discussed in this section. So that would take us to page 11 which is the first of the number pages, the statement of net assets. And I don't have a lot to speak on on this page. I'll, I'll explain what this page as well as the following page is all about. Um, these are presented on what's called the full accrual basis of accounting. So what it does is in the first column, your governmental activities, these are all of the town's funds other than your sewer enterprise. And your sewer enterprise is reported in the second column, which is your business purpose. So in the first column, it, it's really a combination of your, your general fund and projects and trust funds. Uh, they all get consolidated into this one column. And then they get presented on that full accrual basis of accounting, which is the same basis of accounting that a business would follow. It's a little bit different than the way the town tracks its books in that on this page, long-term assets and long-term liabilities are reported. Now the long-term assets are what appears right above the subtotal in the middle of the page. So where you see the, the total assets in the first column of $48.7 million, right above that are the long-term assets, which are your capital assets. And it's broken down into two categories, land and construction in progress, those are your non-depreciable assets, and then other assets net of accumulated depreciation. 
And those are your depreciable assets, which include your buildings, equipment, uh, furnishings, machinery, things like that. So this is the only place that the long-term assets appear in your financial statements. And, and the depreciable assets in the first column, which is $25.1 million, those are being depreciated over the assets' useful lives. Similarly, about two-thirds way down the page, right, right above the subtotal for total liabilities, that subtotal being $11.1 million in the first column, right above that we have non-current liabilities. And there, there are two major components that are reported. Bonds payable of $1.4 million for governmental activities, and then for your business type activities, $350,000. Those are the long-term portions of your bonds payable. There's also a current portion, which appears a couple lines above that, which represents the principal pay downs that, that will occur in, in 2012. The, the balances in your bonds payable of $1.4 million for your governmental and $350,000 for your, your sewer fund are not very high. You, you don't have a lot of debt outstanding. That, that's one thing that stands out in these numbers is there's not a lot of debt there. For communities your size, that's a very low debt burden. The, the remaining other long-term liabilities, which appear right below that, in the first column of $1,588,000, there's actually three components of that for your governmental. The, lar the largest of which is the other post-employment benefits. That, that's a, um, a liability that's only been around for about uh, three years now, and it's, it's because of a, a new uh, Government Accounting Standards Board requirement that, that says that if, if retirees get any benefit from the health insurance program, then the actuaries have to determine what that overall liability is and then come up with a funding schedule, a 30-year funding schedule to fund that. And the amount that does not get funded annually gets reported as a liability each year so that at the end of 30 years, the entire liability will be reported if nothing gets funded. So of that $1.5 million in that first column, 755000 of that is this other post-employment benefits. Now the town doesn't actually pay anything for the uh, retirees health insurance benefit, but because the retirees are required by state law to be included in the same pool of, of insured as your regular town employees, because of that, because of the fact that your retirees would normally have, be paying more for their health insurance, but they're, they're getting a lower rate because they're in the same pool with your current employees, well, they're getting a lower rate, but that means the town employees are getting a higher rate, and the town is paying a higher rate. So that's actually the subsidy. That, that's what the liability represents. The overall liability that the actuaries came up with is about $2 million, and that's reported on the last page of the financial statements. So eventually that entire $2 million will be reported as a liability on page 11 if the town does not fund any of that post-employment benefit. You're not required to fund it. Most municipalities are not doing it. Um, in New Hampshire, there's new legislation which allows you to do that. That's, that's brand new legislation from this past year. That's as a trust fund, right? In a, it, it would be in an irrevocable trust fund. So once the money would go there, it can't be pulled out for any reason, which is different from a capital reserve type program. Just so, and you may not know the answer to this one, but the U.S. Post Office, is that something that they're being asked to fully fund? And it, isn't that the same thing, that they're being asked to fully fund? I do not know. Okay. They're fully funding their retirement. Correct. Unlike what was just said, that we do not have to fully fund it up front. The, the retirement you are, the retirement is... But not the it, health. It's an actuarially sound. I mean, there is a big unfunded liability out there. And, and, and now that you mentioned that, there, there is a new GASB, Government Accounting Standards Board, that's going to be coming out in a couple of years, which is actually going to require you to record a liability on your financial statements that you haven't had to do up until now. The requirement for the pension has been similar to this other post-employment benefits where, where what the requirement is, is if you don't fund the amount that the actuary suggests you do, that's the amount that gets reported as a liability okay. each year. But the pension part is going to be changing in a couple of years. And uh, the, the pension, the entire unfunded amount 
is going to have to be recorded on the balance sheet as a liability going forward. So the state is going to have to tell you how much that liability is because you probably don't know how much that liability is right now. The state right now, tell, they, they, they make it known what the overall unfunded liability is, but it's not divvied up to the towns, all the municipalities. Right. Yeah. The other parts of that other liabilities, back to that number right above the, the subtotal for total liabilities, that 1588 the other parts are landfill post-closure costs. The town has a landfill that's closed. And again, accounting standards require that there be post-closure annual um, costs performed on the landfill and that those be reported as a liability. And so that's 680,000. And the last piece is uh, compensated absences, employee compensated absences of about $153,000, which is employee sick and vacation time at 1231. That summarizes this page. Um, if we could turn to page 13. Page 13 is a balance sheet, but this is presented on a fund accounting basis, which is more of a, a cash basis of accounting, and it's the way that the town tracks its books in its general ledger. The first column is your general fund, and then the second column is non-major, and your non-major is a consolidation of uh, various uh, special revenue and trust funds. In the first column, though, starting from the top and working our way down, the, the very first line, which is cash and short-term investments of $11.6 million, that is actually increased about $1.1 million from the year before. But cash in and of itself is not necessarily a good indicator as to whether you had a good year or a bad year, because it could be really just a matter of timing as to when your bills got paid at the end of the year or your, or your tax bills um, went out at the end of the year. But it is up $1.1 million. It sounds like a lot of cash, but one thing I'd like to point out is in the very middle of the page, you'll notice the largest of the liabilities due to school district of $6,695,000. Of the cash of $11 million that you have, these are monies you collected for taxes for the school district. So you owe the school district $6.6 .6 million, rounded to $6.7 million. But because they're on a fiscal year, that's the amount that you've already collected in taxes but will be paid out in January through June of 2012. Frank, uh, Slugman Devance has a question. Yeah, okay. yeah and you mentioned that through, through June because the question is we're on different uh, budget cycles right. between the two so right. I was just wondering if that had an effect on it. actually it's a two-part question that portion of it and related with that uh, you said this was basically on a cash basis so the cash and short-term investments will not include on uh, taxes for tax bills that have not gone out or how do how does could you explain to us sure. how that works? Yep. If, in other words, if it's on a cash basis, yep. we can, we're not taking into account the rule type. Right. For, for the very first line, that cash and short-term investments of $11.6 million, that's cash in the bank, period. But that's not your fund balance. We'll, right. we'll talk about your fund balance shortly. And, uh, you know, for your fund balance, for the most part, it's on a cash basis of accounting, which means uncollected taxes don't add to your fund balance as they're presented in this report anyway. The, the second, and, and back to the different, different fiscal years between the town and the school district, that certainly has an impact on the cash balance because you're on a calendar year, you've collected most of the taxes through 1231. The bills went out in the fall, you collected most of those taxes, so the money's in hand, but because the school's on a fiscal year, half of their school year, you're, you're gonna be paying out in 2012, so. Then back towards the top, after that first line, the next line is restricted cash of $269,000. That is capital reserve fund cash, and that's different from in the past. There, there's a new accounting standards, again, Government Accounting Standard Board Statement 54, which says that capital reserve funds now get reported in with your general fund for your audited financial statements. So they, they get tracked separately, and it appears separately here, and it, it appears separately in the fund balance section, but it does have to appear in this column now. After that, you have property taxes receivable of $2.1 million. That's the uncollected taxes at the end of the year. 
There is a footnote that appears on page 31 that gives a breakdown by levy year of those receivables. But the bottom line is that uh, the, the majority of that represents, all of it actually represents either the current year levy, the bills that had just gone out and were due towards the end of the year, or prior years that have, have been liened. And because they've been liened, they're protected. So if the properties change hands, or if the property owner files for bankruptcy, the town's still gonna collect those monies when, when the property does change hands. Those receivables of $2.1 million are actually down about $220,000 from the year before. So that, that's a positive trend from the prior year. Moving down into the liability section, some of the larger numbers, the very first liability, was, which is vouchers payable, a million dollars. Those are accounts payable at the end of the year. Those were pretty much paid out in January of 2012. Crude payroll is a, a cutoff of the payroll at the end of the year. We spoke about the due to school district of 6.6 .6 million. Down a little bit lower is deferred revenues, uh, 1,858,000. That's, the, that's an offset to the majority of the receivables above of $2.1 million. What, what this account represents is revenues that are deferred until they're going to be collected. So of the $2.1 million above, $1.8 million of those receivables are deferred and have not been recorded as revenue yet. So the difference between that 2.1 million and the 1.8 million of roughly $250,000 did get recognized as revenue. And it's because there's a, another accounting rule called the 60 day rule that says whatever taxes you collect within 60 days of closing your books can be recorded as revenue. So that's why the deferred revenue is slightly less than the receivables. But the remaining $1.8 million that's in deferred revenues will be reported as revenues in future years when they get collected. Down in the bottom part of the page with the fund balances, the, the names of these fund balances has changed because of that same standard, that same Government Accounting Standards Board Statement 54, which now makes you put the capital reserve funds in this column. It also changes the names of the fund balances, but I'll explain what's in each of these in your general fund. In the the first of them, which is the committed fund balance of 269136 that's the offset to those capital reserves. So those are your capital reserve balances. After that is assigned fund balance, 995782 Those are encumbrances. Those are uh, articles and uh, open purchase orders for your 2011 budget where the monies haven't been fully spent but are being carried forward into 2012 to be spent. Then that leaves the remaining balance of unassigned fund balance, 3468260 This used to be called the undesignated fund balance. And if, if you recall in past presentations, I always said that that's probably the most important number in these financial statements. The bond rating agencies pay close attention to that number. Presented on this basis of accounting, which is generally accepted accounting principles, a modified accrual basis, the bond rating agencies like that unassigned fund balance to be anywhere between 5 and 10 percent of your budget, and, and your budget being just the town's budget. That number on a, on a, accrual, on a modified accrual basis is actually 19.7 percent of your budget. So the bond rating agencies would look at that and say that's a very, very strong fund balance. The um, Department of Revenue Administration, the Hampshire GFOA, looks at it a little bit differently because they, they take that $3.4 million and they actually add the deferred revenue balance to that. So that $1.8 million that's sitting in the liabilities, they, the Department of Revenue looks at your, your fund balance they, they look at your property taxes, and whether you collect them or not, they consider them part of your fund balance because they figure you're ultimately going to collect those dollars. You might not have the cash in hand right now, but you will collect it. So they would take that $3.4 million in the unassigned. They would add the $1.8 million to it, and then they would uh, subtract out an allowance for doubtful accounts. And there is a footnote that appears on page 38 that provides a reconciliation that gets from the numbers on page 13 to the numbers the Department of Revenue would be looking at. Department of Revenue number, when you add and subtract all the different components, would be about $4,958,000. Now, the New Hampshire GFOA 
suggest that that number when compared to the overall budget which includes the school district and the county and the town that that number be about uh, 8 to 17 percent of your budget that number as it appears right now is about 11.3 percent so you're you're right in the middle of a very strong fund balance the way that the New Hampshire GF, GFOA and Department of Revenue would be looking at it so regardless of whether you're looking at your fund balances from a fund accounting basis or on a full accrual which is the way the Department of Revenue would be looking at it it's very strong fund balance that 3.4 million presented on a fund accounting basis the number that appears here on page 13 it's actually increased from the prior year by about uh, by about seven hundred thousand dollars and that's a trend that's been going on for the past five years that fund balance has been going up for the past five years it's been a very strong financial position I don't know whether you need to build any more than you have right now you probably don't you could probably start looking at uh, possibly using some of that as a funding source the bond rating agencies when 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 considering using some of your fund balance they would prefer that you use it for one-time only type projects construction type projects and, and not just as a as a revenue to reduce your tax rate because if you start using it as a revenue to reduce your tax rate it may not be rebuilt in the future and it may not be there in the future but you're, you're in a very good position right now that you, you could probably uh, afford to use some of that for projects if you wanted to Frank is there um, a certain range of of use of fund balance that would still leave us with a um, percentage that would be I guess, I guess highly sought after in terms of a rating agency well a year ago when I met with you and the balance in it at that point was about 2.7 million dollars and I right. think I told you last year I thought it was in a strong financial position right. so you know there's a I'd say at least seven hundred thousand dollars would get you back to where you were a year ago okay the, the selectman's policy financial policy is to maintain a 10 percent so we're over the 10 percent you're over the 10 percent you're at a 11.3 percent which is about seven hundred thousand uh, it would be the the denominator when you include the the school district in the county and the town is forty three million dollars so about four point three million and right now you're at four point nine million so about six hundred thousand yeah. dollars the um, next page is, is page 15 that I had something to mention on there and really just one point in the first call and the third number up from the bottom <clears throat> 760,438 that's the excess of revenues over expenditures uh, for a business this would be your net income for the year so your, your revenues beat your expenses in your general fund by seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars so that's a very positive thing and when we go to the next page which is page 17 we'll see where that came from page 17 is the budget versus actual for your general fund and it presents the budget in two columns original budget and the final budget and they're actually the the same numbers the it, you had the same budget beginning of the year as you did at the end of the year the actual amounts in the third column come from the previous page the in income statement but they get adjusted slightly um, and an example of that would be the last of the revenues so in the middle of the page right above the subtotal for total revenues and other sources you'll see there's a line that says use of fund balance a hundred thousand dollars so you actually use a hundred thousand dollars of fund balance during 2011 fund balance is not really a revenue on the previous page that didn't get included as revenue because whenever you use some of your fund balance it's monies that are earned in prior years not in the current year but for this page for comparative purposes it gets included in here as an actual revenue yep what what accounted for um, it says penalties interest and other taxes and that was a that was a pretty substantial right. variance yeah there. Um, one of the things that get included in there which would fall into the category I guess of the other taxes is um, a, a, a one-time betterment for the Danis Park the okay yeah the, and that was uh, that was the majority of, of that revenue 
If you look at the, the subtotal appearing below that, so the, for the total revenues and other sources in that right-hand column, the revenues beat the budget by $357,546, and, and the majority of that is that line you were referring to. Beyond that, there there's, weren't a lot of uh, revenue surpluses there. And down on the bottom part of the page, um, total expenditures and other uses, the subtotal is 153942 These are the turnbacks. These are the amounts that the departments did not spend or encumber at the end of the year, the closeouts. So those added to your surplus. So on the, on the expense side, the turnbacks were 153000 On the revenue side, up above, the subtotal is 357000 So in all, the town beat the budget by 511,488, that number in the bottom right hand corner. So it was a, a very positive year, again, as the town's uh, experienced in the past few years. This is one more year of uh, positive operating results. After this, the next page, on page 18, is your sewer fund. Can, can I just? Sure. I just want to make sure that I know you understand it, but. For those of the people who might watch this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sue, <laughs> but when we talk about you know beating our budget um, with a 20 roughly, well, our budget was what, 19 or 20 million dollars roughly, okay. Um, we spent all but 153,000, 154,000 mm -hmm. dollars, um, which would probably be like 98, 99 percent of that budget. And then in terms of the revenues, we estimate revenues, and that's an area with the exception of the Danis Park betterment where we got that right by about close to, I'm going to say, if I subtract that out, about seventy to $80,000. So we budgeted pretty tight. We, we still fell within our budget due to the fact that we had some things that we didn't expend, and then we had some revenues that were a little tad better than what we had, but by and large. I mean, it, for us, it was this has been extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most municipalities have felt it that, that same way, but um, it's pretty it's tight. It's pretty tight, yeah. The numbers are not large. Other than that one-time revenue, yeah. the revenues, you wouldn't have had large turnbacks. And on the appropriation side, that's less than 1% yeah. turnbacks. So, okay. Now, those Lynchville Danis Park revenues, though, don't the, offset a general fund. All right. Because that goes towards the debt. With the paid debt on that. Correct. <coughs> you received one-time uh, betterment payments for those that chose to pay up front. Up front. Right. Right. But that's going to be paid over time to uh, the City of Manchester. So right. uh, it's in the general fund now, but it will be paid out over future years. Right. Yeah. Okay. And we are more than likely we're not going to see a similar number and because people did that as a one-time deal, right. not they were given one opportunity to do that. Right. I'm sorry, Frank. The next page is the Sewer Enterprise Fund. And generally accepted accounting principles require that enterprise funds be, pre pre be, <laughs> excuse me, be presented on the full accrual basis of accounting, just like the, the entity-wide, the first couple pages that we talked about. So on this page, there are long-term assets and long-term liabilities that are reported here. The, the first line on the top, cash and short-term investments, $2.6 million. That, I mentioned earlier that for your general fund, it's not necessarily a good indicator, but for your sewer enterprise fund, I think it's a pretty good indicator as to where you stand. That, that basically represents your surplus. Um, your, your sewer operations have a positive cash balance of about $2.6 million, and a, it's very healthy balance. It has been a very healthy balance for the past few years. Um, the, we, the, the long-term assets are reported in the middle of the page, um, a couple lines up from the total assets. You'll see capital assets and with two categories, land construction and progress, and then other assets of $5 million. Um, there's not a lot of long-term liabilities for your sewer operations, about seven or eight lines up from the bottom, bonds payable of 350,000, that's a long-term portion. Then above that, you'll see another 130, which is what's gonna be paid down in 2012. So the, the bonds that have been out there for the sewer are coming to a close. There's just another probably three years remaining to, to pay those down. 
and uh, those will be paid off, and and you're you're left with a, a pretty strong uh, cash balance and a, a strong equity balance. If we look at the next page, which is the income statement for your sewer, I'll, I'll turn your attention to the third number up from the bottom, change in net assets, 721,705. Um, for, for a business, this would be your net income, but there, there is um, a real reason for that. If you go up a few lines from that, you'll see a very large revenue sort of in the middle of the page, intergovernmental revenue, 987794 Those are the, um, the uh, state ERA funds, well, the federal ERA funds that came in during 2011. Most of those monies were actually expended in the prior year. But for whatever they get spent for, they get capitalized as an asset. So the revenues, when they come in, show up as a revenue, but the expenses don't show up as an expense that would offset those revenues. Instead, they get capitalized as an asset, and they're going to be depreciated over their useful lives. So that really means that $721,000 of net income, that third number up from the bottom, was really inflated because of that state money, that ERA money that came in during the year. And had it not been there, it would have been a, a loss of uh, about $250,000 or so which isn't an alarming area of concern for the sewer enterprise fund because there are reserves there. And I, I think uh, the, the sewer department has been using some of its reserves to, to draw down for some of these um, projects. So your sewer fund remains in a very strong financial position. After this, on page 21, I'll just point out what page 21 is all about. This is another balance sheet, statement of fiduciary net assets. The first column is private purpose trust funds, and these are scholarship trust funds that the trustees of the trust funds are holding. Those have to be reported separately. And in the agency column, the second column, uh, those are performance bonds that the town is holding for other people. So there is no net assets. It, it's other people's money, so it's all showing up as a liability. Now, the last page in these financial statements I was going to discuss is towards the back, page 44. And this is for your uh, emergency medical services, your EMS services, which is a special revenue fund that gets budgeted. And because it gets budgeted, there's a budget versus actual presentation here. The top part of the page is the, the revenue side, and if we focus way to the right-hand column, looking at that subtotal for total revenues, the revenues beat the budget by $43,861. And then right below that is the expenditures, so the turnbacks were $47,582. So again, that represents what was budgeted but not spent or encumbered at the end of the year, so it was closed out. So overall, the, the, the budget was a favorable year, the bottom right-hand number, 91,443, which reverts into this EMS fund balance, which is tracked in, in the special revenue funds. And those monies will be available for future appropriation. Right, but Sue, we, we have to be cognizant of that number simply because when we want to buy an ambulance, Capital. that's where we're Capital. going. I, I believe in 2011 we did buy an ambulance, correct? And that's yeah. why that number is so high on terms of the budget, 610000 right. There was an ambulance okay, purchase that year. Just follow up on that, yeah. though. This 91433 represents one year. It represents one year. But this is not the total that's in the fund. Correct. Right. So right. this money that goes into the fund Really, what we're looking at is the funds been increased, correct, by ninety-one thousand four hundred and forty-three dollars. And and similar to that, the last of the lie of, of the revenues, the third line of the revenues, use of fund balance two hundred thirty-eight thousand. That's the amount that was earned in prior years that was used this year to make a purchase. Correct. Okay. So you used two hundred thirty-eight thousand. You were able to rebuild another ninety-one thousand four forty-three to go back into that fund balance. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason why I was I was I was curious uh, was because you know, we we obviously we look at our rates, and this is this is the monies that go into paying for our ambulance replacements and, and equipment. So, 
Yeah. So that summarizes the numbers in the financial statements. Overall, everything looks very strong. Your, your general fund fund balance is in a very good condition. Um, your sewer enterprise fund has a very strong fund balance. Your budget versus actual, uh, your general fund was a little more of a tighter year this year, but the numbers still came out positively, and your EMS services also came out positive. So you had a pretty good year this past year, financially. All right. Um, if, if, I, if I may, uh, Don and Evelyn, would you mind just coming up for a quick second? before I get to your, your question um, you know these types of results I don't, I don't think they happen you know without a lot of hard work and um, in the past we've been very we've been very fortunate you know to have clean reports and this is yet another clean audit and um, so I want to and Don for this was a transition year because you're our uh, you've been our you're not the old uh, director anymore you're the, you're the you're, you are the director so finance director so I um, just want to thank you for for continuing in the tradition that, that we've had. And it's been very challenging for the Board of Selectmen, Budget Committee, the community to try to, you know, have a report such as this one. We certainly have our challenges ahead of us, but I think now you've, Frank, and you, you've kind of given us kind of a roadmap as to, we have a couple of different tools in our belt, obviously one-time use of fund balance and or a bonding, a bonding opportunity which it would appear with rather low interest rates may be an opportunity for us to address some of our expenditures that we have on the horizon in a, in a, in a prudent way. So um, before I get to your question, is there anything that you want to add um, with respect to the audit, John? I'd just like to add that a lot of the work is due to the excellent staff that I have, Evelyn and Linda and Renee and Gail uh, do an outstanding job every day since I've been here. I need to give them most of the credit for this. I'd also like to compliment Melance and Heath. <clears throat> They're very good to work with. Uh, we've worked a lot with Brian McDermott. He's been excellent. He's, he's very quick at returning phone calls. If either myself or Evelyn or anyone has a question for them, they're responsive and courteous 100% of the time, and, and we really appreciate it. Evelyn, you want anything? You're good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, I, I, I wanted to get uh, onto one thing, and I, I thought it was important to touch base on this, uh, especially for uh, people that are in our viewing audience. As you mentioned, this is a transition year for our new finance director. I mean, knew he's been around for a while now, uh, Don Bora, uh, who took over for um, uh, for, for Jan. Yeah. Uh, O'Connor, uh, who had been for many years, and but I think what uh, I'm I'm looking at and and uh, I'm appreciative of is the fact that this now is a third year that in the auditor's letter there are no recommendations. Right. And last year that was a big thing because it was two years in a row, and I brought up and I asked you specifically how many other communities in New Hampshire don't have a recommendation and how many have gone two years in a row. Mm -hmm. And now we are here, well, we got to that. Evelyn was on board at the time. Uh, we've had the same uh, administration. And, and on the Jan, we got to that point. And now we have Don here at the helm and we've gone three years with that. So I think that that is to commend right. everybody that's work, working here and I'm, I, I, I can't be prouder. I mean, as, as a selectman in the town of Goff Center, to be able to say that we've gone three years in a row without a recommendation on the auditor's letter. So yeah. we, I, have to, I have to just congratulate everybody. Yeah, and I agree, especially in a transition year, you know, to, to go through without having a formal management letter, without any, uh, you know, significant deficiencies. We, we did have a few areas where we made some recommendations to management, though, and it, it, it's because being a small town, there tends to be segregation of duties issues sometimes, and, and so we made some recommendations to your management that they ought to look into um, documenting oversight over some of those departments to um, make sure that there is some segregation of duties occurring. 
Um, the, the sewer department is one of them, recreation, tax collector, town clerk. Um, they're all small departments uh, without a lot of personnel. So the, we always make recommendations to get another set of eyes looking at things. So, uh, But as far as the condition of the accounting records, when we, when we come in to do the audit, the books are closed, uh, numbers balanced, and very provable. Um, and it, it makes the audit uh, very uh, efficient to perform. And, and your staff is all very cooperative to us also. Hey, well, thank you. If I may, we're also implementing some of those suggestions already that Mr. Byron just mentioned. So we're already doing it. Good. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. It's approximately 7.05, and uh, we're right on track, actually, with... Uh, our town administrator's report. I have a short report for you tonight. Um, your weekly meeting schedule is in your packets. I won't go through that. For your consensus folder tonight, you have an accounts payable manifest for $138,383.64 <coughs> and a payroll with holding manifest of $147,414.02. You have employee status reports, a retired crossing guard, and a new hire for call firefighter. You have event permit for St. Anselm College football games on September 14th, October 6th, October 13th, and October 26th. And a right to insure for the Hoffs and, I'm not going to pronounce that name, I'm not sure, I don't want to demolish it. Uh, for Shirley Hill Cemetery, Section 3, Lot 45A. And another one for Hoff for Shirley Hill Cemetery, Section 3, Lot 82. So I have a motion to accept the consensus so folder. There's a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 4-0, right. motion passes. Thank you. Um, and you don't have any correspondence this week. The police chief, I was talking to him today, um, is recommending that we continue our tradition of trick-or-treat hours October 31st, which is a Wednesday this year, from 6 to 8 p.m., but it takes a vote of the board to. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Stop by the firehouses. We'll have plenty of candy for the kids this year. It's <laughs> wearing the frosty outfit this year. Oh, who's slapping um, okay, so, so that... I did have one more item. Okay. Um, Southern New Hampshire Planning Regional Planning Commission is, um, and the Central New Hampshire Regional Planning Commission will be working together with all communities located in Hillsborough and Merrimack counties to, to develop a comprehensive economic development strategy. I sent you an email earlier today with what I'm reading right now. Um, at this time, they're seeking our municipalities' participation in the development of the CEDS and to formally appoint one representative from your municipality to the strategy committee. So my question to you would be, um, do, you, do you want to go forward and um, recruit someone to serve on this? And if so, uh, what process do you want to use? Make a suggestion. Yes. That perhaps we uh, reach out to economic development to see if there's somebody there. And one of the other things, I'd like to get a little bit more information about this, about the program. There, did you get your email? Today? Yes, I did. I, I, I mean, there's a lot to go through uh, on that. I did go through it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand a lot of things that are in there, but uh, I just want to make sure that we have an understanding of of what we're uh, what we're not necessarily signing on to, but uh, what the commitment is. Well, well, and what it, what it involves, and the reason why I say that is that we've had a couple of other things that we voted to go forward with, and I've received a lot of comments uh, that uh, were not so positive about us going forward with some of them. So I just want to make sure that. Um, we we have a full understanding of, of yeah it seems like the carrot in this one is to obtain federal funding for right. public infrastructure projects well i don't know if it's a requirement maybe the kickoff meeting will go into more detail on that uh, i understand but there's one general tie-in on a lot of the things that that we've had one of the tie-ins is it, it i have a concern that 
it could it could have an effect on what I consider some of the long term things that have made Goffstown Goffstown for what it is. Uh, there seems to be a, a, a trend, and this is the type of a carrot, to try to get more type of concentrated multifamily housing. Uh, it's, it's to reduce the, the uh, get more compact areas and, and affect the, the urban, the, 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 large, <coughs> the larger, the larger plot, the larger properties that we have, they seem to be get more condensed uh, things condensed because they're looking at it and they're saying that there's an efficiency of the scale here so that if everybody has uh, you have everything's within a walking distance everything is within public transportation uh, your your housing is going up rather than going and uh, using up more land uh, and I don't necessarily the and the comments and the feedback that I've gotten from members of the community is that uh, just have a concern that uh, Goffstown, uh, a, a change that could be that's not made Goffstown the favorable community that it's been. That's all. Okay, so, so to summarize, the sentiment that you're hearing from some constituents is that the goals or perhaps the vision of Southern New Hampshire planning or the grants which they're applying for may not coincide with what some of our goals, aspirations, and values may be here in Goffstown. And we have to make sure that they at least somewhat align. There, there, there's, there's a concern. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that, that um, there I, is a concern. I just want to, I've heard similar comments from constituents myself, so I would concur with what you said. I think for me personally, before signing on, I'd like to see specifically what are, you know, what is the vision? What is the end game um, before you know we become a party to it? Because obviously they're looking to have a mass of communities so that it sells their um, vision or maybe for a federal application, et cetera, it's more viable. But before we do that, I'd like to make sure that it aligns with what our master plan is, what our vision of our community is. Selectman Adams? Well, I guess I'd like some more detail. I mean, when you say you received a number of concerns from constituents, I mean, I don't know what that means. How many people, what are their concerns? I, what I, mean, I hear you know, is very similar to what um, Selectman DeVanza well, said. I didn't hear anything um, specific. Um, oh, the, in terms of, uh, you, know, you know, case in point was the, um, the housing on, um, on, Mass, on Mass Road where um, I guess it was uh, affordable or, or workforce type type housing, and Abington yeah, Square. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know some of the concerns that, that, that I had that I have heard from from folks was that okay, we had a project that was initially going to be X percentage say residential, and I, I know locally now we have made the decision to make it more of that and less you know commercial, which which a lot of folks are concerned that it could be, be put more of a drain on our services. Um, but that's what I have. That's that's what I've heard. Not so much. I haven't heard the building up versus you know building well, sideways. Well, a, a lot thing, but a I've, lot I've of that gets that. a lot of that gets into agenda twenty one. Okay. I mean, other than that one project, are we hearing other than that? Or I mean, because that doesn't seem to be a far overarching concern. I understand there's been a lot of debate about that whole project and the way it's played out versus the way it was presented initially right, right. and how it was changed and modified over the years. But I mean, are we hearing anything other than that one project or is that what well, that well, t t tend to be the center of conversation? No, some, some express concerns as to Southern New Hampshire planning and what their goals and vision is, is to, and, and it doesn't align with theirs, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily, it might not align with Goffstown's, it do, doesn't align with theirs. Um, but that was the, what you would, would uh, you know what I mentioned with Abington you know square that was that was a, a bit of a bit of a concern um, that was it and maybe it's just a communication thing you know where we have to just you know articulate you know what are the you know what are the continued benefits of being associated with Southern New Hampshire planning or any other entity in which we kind of leverage we're able to leverage our size of our community and, and try to do things that are more regional in, in, in effort. But Selectman LeMay, you have anything you want to weigh in on on this? No, or? I'm kind of 
kind of open. I'd like to hear a little bit more, probably see what. Okay. What I mean, it's fair to say we just got this this afternoon, right. and right. and, right. and uh, Chairman Pierce isn't here, so yeah. I think we can just you know put it on the next agenda, and then okay. we can kind of deliberate on that a little bit more. Um, I mean, I think historically that we we've, we've pretty much embraced a lot of the initiatives that Southern New Hampshire has planning has um, come to us with. So, um, any other new any other business, Sue? No. Okay. Um, for the selectmen, is there any old business that you want to bring up? Not hearing any. Any new business? Not hearing any. And then lastly, we have uh, two committee reports. The first is uh, EDC. We met last week. Um, our meeting was held on the uh, 7th of August here at the Town Hall. We, again, in detail, discussed the business welcoming and mentoring program for the, um, for the towns and new businesses in town. Um, we're trying to get to the new businesses, make sure, welcome them, make sure they're all set, see how they're doing, make sure that everything is okay. Um, the Glen Lake Waterfront Ordinance was discussed with the board um, as to allow, allowing um, different activities to have permits over at uh, Glen Lake. That's still ongoing. Uh, the New Hampshire DOT I-293 Exit 6 and 7 Improvement Study um, was, a, I guess, a comment or a question made that should we contact Senator Lou D'Alessandro as to uh, getting some assistance to see if we can get that extension to come up to the actual Goff Town back road instead of stopping it at Dumbarton Road where they where they plan to stop it. That was that was talked about. Do we want to ask him to um, see if he would possibly shed some light for the town of Goff Town to try to bring in the you know bring in that road a little bit further? I know Sue wrote the letter to. Manchester this week thank you very much for doing that um, hopefully that will open up some avenues we I explained that to the board as well and the board is 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 hopefully you know um, they feel very positive that we could open up the lanes of traffic that um, knowing that we can have some commercial traffic there and you know that might that might be an added incentive to get that road to where to where it need be that was pretty much it um, New Hampshire DOT and the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission review of the Rails and Trails Transportation. They're having meetings on the September 4th, September 7th, 10th, and 14th at 9 a.m. They're going to review different parts and portions of the Rails to Trail, see what see what's been done, um, and just get together and see what can be done. There was discussion um, about the work that that has been done. They they they've commented that. Uh, the trail is looking better all the time. It's getting better all the time, um, you know, with, with all the help and the, the grant money that's there. Uh, looking forward to continuing the expansion of the rails to trail so that uh, we can continue, continue growing, whether it be north, south, east, or west. But it would be nice to be able to leave here, go all the way to Manchester to the, to the stadiums like they talked about and, you know, ride, ride your bikes or walks or do things like that. That was pretty much it. Okay. Any questions for Selectman LeMay? Um, next is uh, the Sewer Commission report. Yeah, Sewer Commission met uh, briefly on the 9th to talk about the 2013 budget, uh, setting up a workshop um, next week or so to uh, develop some of the uh, line items for, for the 2013 budget. Uh, talked about the intermunicipal agreement with the City of Manchester and came up with a final flow number of uh, 2.13. Um, Final draft reflecting that number has been submitted to the city for attorney review and submission to the attorney general's office for uh, final approval. Uh, there's some discussion about mass road paving. We've already gone through that earlier in the meeting, so I won't reiterate what was talked about there. Uh, as far as the Reed Street and Temple Court sewer line replacement, uh, Temple Court unfortunately has been delayed. There was a lot more ledge removal than expected, so they put that on hold and moved over to Reed Street so that they could do that work so as to avoid uh, congestion at the Maple. Maple Ave intersection uh, when school reopens, and then they'll switch back to Temple Court and finish that after Reed Street is completed. And then finally, on South Mast and Mast Road manholes, 
looking to replace some of those before final paving, obviously. Uh, each one, just so you know, is about 250 bucks to, to uh, adjust those and raise those. So this costs for about another $9,000 for that section of miscellaneous manholes. Uh, Steve Crean did recommend repairing all the mast holes. The <laughs> master hose manholes. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> mast, uh, mast road manholes. Um, prior to paving, uh, motion was made and seconded to, uh, to complete that work. Uh, and that would take it just up to, it says the Exxon station, but it's actually a Gulf station at this point, I believe. Cumberland Farms it is a Gulf station. But so, it, you know, replace and adjust those manholes up to that point. All right. Any questions for um, Sewer? All right. Uh, any other business? I have one. I just had one comment. I should have said it earlier. Occasionally, this past, I think it was this past week or a couple of weeks ago, we, we got, we, we get anonymous letters every once in a while to the Board of Selectmen or to administration. Um, we typically do not respond to anonymous letters uh, that are sent to the Board of Selectmen or to the administration. Um, and sometimes um, there are, there could be very valid reasons why an individual wants to let the town know that whether it be a vendor or an employee or they have some sort of an issue. Um, it's, it's important if, if something does bother a citizen that they feel compelled to write uh, a letter or to notify us. Um, we would appreciate us being able to contact you if, and, and, and try to you know, get the story straight because if it is something that we do have to make an adjustment on, um, it's imperative that we have the right to gather more information. It's the only way that, that we can do it. So um, I just want to let folks know that you know we, we we read them, but we rarely can take we, we can't take action more often than not simply because it's un, it's only one person's side of the story. So um, that was that. Anything else? I'll accept a, a motion to adjourn, to adjourn by second. Second. Adams has a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's.